Welcome to Beyond the Scale. Today, we have the founder of Buffalo Gal Grass-Fed Beauty, Shally Carroll. Not only does Shally create clean skin care, she co-owns and operates a regenerative grass farm in Georgia, and she also eats an animal-based diet. So Shally, thank you so much for being here with us. We're so excited to meet you and hear about all your good stuff. Um, please tell us how and why you began eating this way and what that looks like for you on a daily basis. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's see. I mean, I guess I would have to go back into my 20s. I'm in my 50s now, but in my 20s, I kind of got on the kick with everyone else about becoming a vegetarian. You know, um, back then, vegan wasn't so popular, but being a vegetarian kind of was. So I went along with that and tried that fad out for about seven years. And at first it was really kind of good, um, but I think my body might've just been doing a, a nice cleanse. Um, but then eventually I started losing muscle, muscle mass. Um, my thyroid was a mess. I would say my hormones were all over the place. And, um, you know, and so, I mean, I had like just really a foggy brain and I became very anemic. And, you know, and even though I was under the um, help of a nutritionist and I was taking all the supplements, um, I couldn't really maintain that type of diet, even though I have an A negative blood type. My dosha says that I should be vegetarian. All these things were pointing toward being a vegetarian, but when it came down to it, it was just wrecking my health. So um, a few years later, I started, um, I just decided to reintroduce some like a bison burger into my diet and it was kind of like all of a sudden this you know like cloud lifted you know off of me and I realized that I needed to be eating meat even though I was surrounded by people who were vegetarians and you know really strict about it and that kind of thing um I um you know I was you know realizing that you know hey this is I need to listen to my body and what it's trying to tell me um it took me quite a while to really get around to where I needed to be but um oh I'd say like 20 years ago or so I ran into Dr. Mercola's website and his newsletters and he was talking about the importance of grass-fed meat and you know and um he was talking about probiotics and all these things that people weren't really talking a whole lot about then and that's when I started learning a lot about grass-fed meat and so I started eating grass-fed meat based on his recommendations and that kind of thing now I grew up on a small farm and I was fortunate enough that my parents um we're really into kind of basic, you know, farmstead, homestead kind of life, a living. And, um, and so we, uh, we had a milk cow in the family. Um, we ate our own meat that, that we raised on our farm. We raised pigs and chickens. We had our own eggs. We baked our own bread. We had, you know, um, grew a huge garden every year. And so, um, so I had some really good nutritional, you know, points of view underneath my belt with, without really realizing that. And, um, and that's just kind of like the basis of what I drew upon. When I um, got into high school and college, I was very involved in the FFA by having my own livestock um, at home and that kind of thing. But when um, after college, I moved out west and I lived in Colorado for about 17 years, um, you know, so I didn't really do much with my degree or my knowledge base then. Um, and then, you know, we fast forward to like 2008. Um, I started dating my husband um, who lived in Georgia. We dated for a really short time in college and we reconnected on Facebook when Facebook kind of first started becoming a thing. So we're a Facebook story. And so I moved back to Georgia in 2009 and he had been farming all that time. And so um, he's, he's always been a farmer and, um, you know, livestock in, in particular. Um, and he's just never really been a fan of commodity agriculture and has always been interested in doing something that's alternative and outside of the commodity box. And um, he had started raising water buffalo um, as a way of, you know, he needed a large ruminant to eat some of the hay that he was growing um, on these, you know, beautiful organic fields. And um, he was raising hay um, for polo ponies that he raised and trained and he played polo at the time. And um, so he needed a large ruminant to eat some of the, the hay that wasn't quite horse quality. So um, he met a man who was who had water buffalo in Florida and decided to just get some calves and just see what happens. And uh, once those those cows started having their first calves um, and those animals were, you know, getting to be about a year old, um, he started having some of the Asian 
um, members of our community driving down the driveway from the Hmong community and water buffalo is their traditional food for, um, you know, for feasts when they have weddings and funerals. And so they were pulling down the driveway, wanting to harvest a buffalo, and this became a business. And so, um, so eventually, um, when he would have, you know, like annual parties at the farm and that kind of thing, um, just a lot of just your regular everyday person would, you know, they're, I've heard about grass fed, you know, I've, I, I want to try this meat, I've liked this meat, and can I buy this meat? But um, because water buffalo are outside of the commodity box, um, they're not on the, they were not on the list of, of livestock that were approved for inspection. Um, so we couldn't sell the meat to the public. You know, you had to buy like a quarter or a half or a whole. That's another whole story that you wouldn't even believe um, that we had to go through. So, um, so let me just say no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> so, you know, uh -huh. so doing something that's just really kind of new and different like that, um, you know, we, we had to go through a lot to get to the point that we were able to process our meat under inspection. Um, so that didn't happen until 2012. And um, and so let me just say that just as I was coming through through that time frame, you know, um, having access to our own meat was just like such a, you know, a privilege in my opinion, you know, being able to have this meat that we could harvest and um, and put on the table that we know how it was raised and, you know, it was raised with, you know, so much care for the land and the environment and the community. Um, and and so, that, so that's kind of really how my meat-based uh, approach to my diet really took hold, I think is when um, I got together with my husband. So yeah, so that's been an interesting journey. Um, and so we've been processing our meat under inspection since 2012. And that's about the time that I started Buffalo Gal because uh, we, um, what happened is we went to, um, well, we had a restaurant in Atlanta that um, wanted to do a feast with our meat as soon as it was uh, available, you know, under inspection. And um, they did a five course feast and the dessert, they uh, rendered the suet into tallow and used that for the pastry for the dessert. So after the feast, there were some leftover tallow. And so I thought, you know, I know my grandma did some stuff with this, you know, but I don't know what all she did. I knew that she always had tallow on the stove somewhere, <laughs> you know, and she used it for cooking and she also made candles with it. And so as I started kind of playing around with it, um, I realized that it was really, really um, felt so good on my skin because I made a mess in the kitchen with it. You know, one time I spilled some and then I was cleaning it up and, and I felt how it felt on my hands. My hands just felt like new, like you've gone to the spa and you did the paraffin dip, you know, which is, I don't recommend doing, <laughs> but um, you know, you've done the paraffin dip and then your hands come out and they feel so wonderful. That's how it felt when I had my hands in tallow. Um, and so um, I had been in a 20 year struggle with Burt's Bees lip balms because I was trying to use a natural product for my lips and it just didn't do the trick. And in fact, I was very frustrated with it. And I thought to myself, hey, this might be what I need for my lips. And so I played around with making lip balms and that's really how Buffalo Gal got started. So just to kind of give you everything in a nutshell. That is fascinating. Like just the, how one step just kind of lent itself to your business growing and yeah growing, like just organically like yes <laughs> you know? yeah 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 and so um I started selling those lip balms because I was trying to avoid using beeswax at the time just because of that kind of negative relationship that I had with Burt's Bees I was trying to use a natural product and it just you know um, was causing a lot of dryness and irritation and so I had to keep reapplying it just like you would Carmex or you know Vaseline or something like that's petroleum based that's really bad for you and so I thought what was the you know so there's got to be something that can be really um, you know much more satisfying that can last all day so I had been looking for this ingredient for years and years when I came back from Colorado with all my dry skin and the sun damage that I got from living out there. Um, and, you know, and I was like, you know, tried everything, sea buckthorn, you know, I tried shea butter, I tried everything and, and um, had a lot of experience with natural 
ingredients in skincare um, because I did have a bath salt company with a with another friend when I lived there for for a short while and so we we did a lot of things with natural ingredients and so I had a lot of familiarization with them at the time but I was looking for that really special ingredient and I didn't realize it was right there in my pasture <laughs> and so um, so Literally when I right under your yeah, nose, yes, right under my nose. And so, um, <laughs> yes. And so after I started making lip balms and selling them, um, and I first started selling them and a facial moisturizer that I, I, I kind of invented at the time, um, at a Weston A price uh, conference when they came to Atlanta and we, we were a meat sponsor. So we, we sold them or we sponsored, um, one of their dinners with um, a meatloaf and then they did another thing with some of our heart and liver and that kind of thing um, during the whole conference and so um, I was just completely blown away by how many people were really interested in buying the lip balms and my facial moisturizer at the time I didn't know what a tallow balm was at that time and people said that's a tallow balm that's a tallow balm and okay. so and that's when I started learning oh it does have a name okay <laughs> and so <laughs> so that's kind of how it all got started a long time ago and it just grew from there that's amazing. Um, what about, so go back to your, your diet for just a second. Um, what, what health benefits have you noticed and what does, what does meat-based look like for you? Okay. Are you more carnivore? Is it more ketovore? What does that look like? And what, what benefits have you noticed since then? And is your family that, okay. all of that so diet as well? That's a really good question. So um, I would say my family in general are more just omnivores um, with more of like a, a Weston A. Price approach or a paleo approach, you know, just depending on the family member. Some can have dairy, some can't, you know, that kind of thing. When um, when I first really learned about that you could go carnivore, like just, just eat meat and salt and water and, you know, and just kind of go with that and just try it for 30 days, like Kevin Stock says to do, um, mm -hmm. and just see what happens, you know. Um, I gave that a try, and I really loved it, so I kept doing it for a couple of more months, um, and I included some dairy because I love cheese and that kind of thing, so, um, and I just really felt great. Um, for me, I find that I do better if I'm doing something that's more like ketovore, you know, mm -hmm. where I can have, like what I say is like it's meat with, you know, um, condiments <laughs> you know you can have pickles and you know other things that kind of go with that so I find that I do a little better if I have you know other things and I think that's more for you know my brain you know just my thought process you know just kind of like a, my emotional side about food than it is anything else you know because of course I don't find that it's necessary but what I really have found is when I am focusing on a meat-based diet it's how I feel. You know, I have more energy. Um, if I've had any aches and pains, those go away. It's amazing to realize that it's, you know, vegetables and other kinds of carbohydrates in our diet that kind of, that cause the inflammation that give us aches and pains, you know, and that kind of thing. So, um, so I would just say more than anything, it's like how you feel, you know, how's your digestion, you know, do you have the energy to do this? Like, things that you're looking at doing like on a farm, you know, I do a lot of physical work. And so sometimes you're just looking at something you're like, oh, is there an easier way to do that rather than just running over there and just doing it? You know, you're not, you're kind of like wanting to be lazy when you have inflammation, right? And you're, you know, looking for that lazier way to do things. Like we don't have any golf carts or, um, you know, or any like four wheelers or, um, you know, um, Polaris side-by-sides or anything like that on our farm, my husband and I, and I say, well, we just have to walk, you know, we're just going to have to walk. And so doing that gives us that exercise, but it's also, also that connection to the land, but, you know, you want to feel really good and, and fueling yourself and eating your diet, you know, how you're eating is going to affect all of the things that you can do on your farm, you know? So, yeah. So I would say it's, it's really been more of a key to approach that I do these days, um, you know, some carbs in there that, you know, that I, that like winter squashes and, and, you know, I love winter squashes and some fruits and that kind of thing too. So just like that, that mental need for a little bit more variety. Yeah. I think yes. Amy agrees with that. She, yeah, she definitely it, likes the variety. Yeah. Like when I hear people talk about being a food addict, I'm like, yes, I'm, you know, okay. 
you know, I have food addictions, <laughs> so <laughs> it's okay. Just to, but then I don't need to like fight myself or my body or my mind or my emotions about it. Like when I'm having really stressful days, you know, the things you want are, are comfort, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's ways to find comfort food that's not outside of, you know, that doesn't have to be junk food. It doesn't have to be, you know, something that's really harmful to eat. It can be, you know, it can be something like some ice cream that you made like out of kefir or something like that you know so I find ways to give myself comfort foods that um that um, are satisfying for those parts of me that kind of need that especially when I'm stressed um you know that that don't really you know that don't really cause harm that I don't really notice like a negative effect from doing it you know right. that aren't processed foods that's right that's right yeah right yeah, my I, would, is right. I would also add when you said winter squash, I have a, such a thing in my head about eating by the seasons, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, like squashes in the fall and strawberries it, when strawberries are, you know, mm -hmm. available and that kind of thing. And it's, it's really hard for me to be, to think that those things are bad for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, that. Yeah. Um, I, I grew up eating squashes from the garden and, you mm -hmm. know, strawberries and raspberries when they were in season and that kind of thing. And it's really hard, you know, if that doesn't bother your particular body, I, it's hard for me to think that that's bad, you know? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so. so I always just say, how do you feel after you eat it? You know, like yeah. I can look at something and say, wow, that looks really good, but how am I going to feel after I eat that? You know, I already kind of know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, um, I, um, I have been also kind of like trying to do a little bit of focus lately on, um, on circadian rhythm, and mm. you know, light hygiene and that kind of thing and how that affects hormones, especially as I'm aging and have gone through menopause and, you know, going through all of the hormonal changes and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so I've, I've been doing like I did Sarah Kleiner's um, 21 day leptin reset. Um, or, you know, I followed the program, but I'm just, you know, it takes a while to incorporate everything into it, you know, but one of the things she says is that if you can't find it at your farmer's market, you probably shouldn't eat it, you know, as, as far as like your fresh vegetables go. I mean, given that a lot of farmers do have the high tunnels where they can, you know, the greenhouses where they can grow a lot of things that might not always be in season, but I think a lot of farmers do try to follow the, you know, the more of your organic farmer farmers or your certified naturally grown farmers will try to follow more seasonal um more seasonal vegetables and fruits when they when they pick out what they're going to grow for a season so so i try to just kind of you know i don't really i don't i i found that i don't really actually get along with things like broccoli or spinach or some of those really leafy greens but i do get along really well with squashes <laughs> mm. some fruits you know not all fruits but some fruits yeah, I've really found that too. Um, just to get a, a head to a different topic, I guess, will you talk to us about, I think in our community, a lot of us are familiar with regenerative farming, mm -hmm. um, but will you kind of go through that a little bit and, and sure, tell us what sure. it means? I'm going to grab just a sip of water here. Yeah. So. Um, regenerative agriculture, really what it means is that you're farming in such a way that is truly sustainable. And so sustainable is like one of those big buzzwords out there um, that may or may not, kind of like the word natural, you may, it may or may not actually mean what you think that it means. Um, but sustainability really means that something can continue and perpetuate on its own. Um, it doesn't need outside inputs. It doesn't need subsidization, subsidizing from any outside forces. It's something that can, um, you know, proliferate on its own. And so regenerative agriculture kind of, in my opinion, has that same kind of um, concept. So what you're doing is you are farming in such a way that you're respecting, you know, first of all, your natural environment um, and you are farming in such a way that you are regenerating what is there. So you're, you're creating more and more nutrition by your management and by your management decisions um, in the soil. You're creating more microorganisms, um, a, a more diverse ecosystem of plants, 
of insects, of microbes, especially microbes, um, and a diversity of wildlife around you in the places where you are managing your livestock. So livestock is generally going to be involved in all regenerative agriculture, if not just wildlife. You have wildlife and livestock um, because you do need animals to disturb and uh, to disturb the, the plants that are there, um, large hooves um, drive seeds into the ground, the manure replenishes and um, replenishes uh, the nutrients in the soil. Um, you've got a whole lot of things going on there at one time. And so when you're when you have a regenerative farm, um, even if it's just one acre, what you're doing is rotating. And, you know, so it's, it, to me, it's a system of disturbance and rest. So you have one area that's getting disturbed by animal activity, and then you rotate those animals into another place. So then that area now has a chance to rest. And so um, with the manure piles that you've got right there, the dung beetles come up and grab the manure and take it under the earth. And it brings all that nutrition back under the soil. And you've got grass that has a chance for the roots to grow longer. So whatever's going on on top goes on below. So if you've overgrazed an area, you have like depleted the soil because the roots can't hold that soil anymore um, or the water. And so you're um, so it's a process of basically disturbing, but also giving it a chance to rest and rejuvenate. And when it rejuvenates, it comes back even stronger. So it's a process of becoming more and more nutritious, more and more diverse, more and more biodiverse, I guess is the is the appropriate word for that. Um, whenever you have a system set up on a plot of land that's considered regenerative agriculture. So it's not just about being organic per se, or, you know, something like that. Organic um, basically just means not using the chemicals or fertilizers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it is regenerative. So if you see something that's organically grown, it may or may not have been regeneratively produced. And so you can use, you can do regenerative agriculture um, with just like growing crops if you're bringing in the manure, but you've got to get that from someplace. So that is an outside input. So, it, you know, so I, I really do believe that it has to be part of a system that does involve wildlife or livestock. So that's mm. a little bit about it, about it in a nutshell. So Can I ask one question, Stephanie, yeah. real quick first? Um, so if we're in the grocery store, what are we, what meat are we looking for um, that is helpful to the environment, helpful to our own bodies? Um, does the word organic mean anything um, when it's on a label? Like what, what can we buy that's actually helping in some way? So if you're going to a grocery store, you're, I, I always just say, choose from the best you have. So yeah. You may not have any choices. There might just be, you know, just a pound of ground. You have no idea where it came from. And you may, that may be your only choice. And, you know, that's going to be better than choosing Beyond Meat or, <laughs> or some of the other things that are out there. But I, I would always say that, you know, if something says organic, um, if it's related to livestock, like beef or pork or something like that, um, when it says organic, it's probably meaning that, um, either they had their pasture certified organic, which is kind of rare, but a, a lot of times it means that it may have been fed grain that has been certified organic. So mm -hmm. to me, that doesn't really, you know, if grass fed is important to you, you know, you would want to make sure that, um, that it's grass finished as well, a hundred percent, you know, so a little bit of grain in there is not a hundred percent. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times that, uh, when something has an organic label, you know, and it's meat, it's going to be something that has been fed some sort of organic grain. So just to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and it, it's kind of like a misleading type of thing. Um, so it's a little bit of greenwashing there, in my opinion. But um, so it just depends, uh, you know, if it's if if the um, if the grocer may have a relationship with a particular farm, or a particular distributor who has relationships with farms that um, that they know that this meat is grown a certain way, it was pasture raised, but it was fed some grain, that's going to be a better choice than something that was fed grass the first part of its life, which most all livestock is, and then finished on just a feedlot somewhere where they're contributing to very polluting lagoons full of manure that's that's way too concentrated and and not not appropriate you know for the environment there um so i would think that you know if you're if you're doing something that's if you're eating something that's grain finished 
it's environmentally not friendly because you're contributing to what a feedlot does to the environment. But if you can get something that was pasture raised, maybe fed a little bit grain, that's going to be a better choice. But if, but in my opinion, always the best choice is 100% grass fed. Mm. So, um, and there again, that's not something that's very regulated. So you kind of have to get to know your source. Um, so um, you know, somebody can say my meat is 100% grass fed, but that means that they just didn't feed their animals any grain and they may not have had any pasture for them either. And they may be very, you know, they didn't really have a good finish. They just were just these thin animals that they finally took to the packing house, you know? So, um, so there's an art to finishing an animal properly. The finish, what a finish means is, um, the amount of fat that the animal puts on when it's finished growing. So it's frame is finished growing and now you're laying on the fat. And so there's an art to that. And a lot of people don't really understand how to do that. Um, a lot of people think, well, I've got to give them grain or they won't get fat enough, you know, and that's not true. It's how you manage your pastures and your forage chain. So, um, and then how you, you know, how you rotate those pastures and, you know, and all of that. And it's a challenge. So um, it just kind of depends on where you live and everything too. So. So I think it's just a matter of when you go to the grocery store, you know, you're kind of just in a, you know, in a blind setting in a way you have to just use your best judgment and, you know, you're going to just have to make the best choice that you can in that moment to answer that question. Thank <laughs> so, you. I appreciate that because, you know, that's what it feels like that, you know, I want to do what's best for my body. I want to do what's best for the environment and I want to do what's best to help people like you, but I've not really been sure what that was. So thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. So the best thing to do is there are a lot of good websites out there um, where you can look for local farms like Eat Wild is one of them. There's there's some more out there too. Um, the regenerative um, Farmers of America, they're doing a lot to try to connect the consumer to actual regenerative farms. Um, and I think it's just kind of like know your farmer, know your food is really the way to do it. So, um, for example, someone recently contacted us about, um, you know, humane certified, you know, the America, uh, uh, let's see, um, um, animal welfare approved and some of those certifications out there, um, you know, and they were asking, you know, are your products, you know, do they come from the, does your, does your, is your meat any of those certifications? And we say no, because, well, one thing, um, they don't really even represent most of our species of livestock that we raise. So it's just, it's not like we could really get on board with them, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really more to the story than that. It's a lot more nuanced than that when it comes to like how animals are raised, uh, you know, whether what they're fed and how they're raised. Um, so there's, you know, everyone tends to have some of their own program, what they have to do, what really works best for their operation. And um, so I think it's just kind of getting to know local farms. The best way to to support them is just get to know them and go to them to buy, you know, go go directly to them to buy whenever you can. Um, you know, so um, what was I going to say about that? <laughs> there was something else I was going to say about that. But um, so it's, it's just really kind of getting to know your local farmers. We have an open door policy. So that's one of the things I told this person is, you know, um, it's wonderful what you're doing. You're trying to connect consumers to the humanely certified or the, you know, farms that do practice um, humane raising of livestock, which is generally going to be regenerative in many ways. Um, but as far as, um, you know, those certifications go, most people aren't really going to bother with those kind of things because you've got to go wait for an inspector. You got to fill out all this paperwork. You got to pay a fee. You know, those kind of things are kind of really add up and, and most people are just too busy to really, really do that. And so we have an open door policy. Any of our customers are welcome to come and see what we do. They show up and they're like, I don't see anything. <laughs> It's usually what happens. I'm like, what did you expect to see? You know, and they like, I really don't know what I was expecting to see, but I don't see anything. I just see, you know, grass and animals. And I'm like, that's what you're supposed to see. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so um, I, 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 you know, people really don't, I think we've really gotten very disconnected from our food um, over the past couple of generations. But I think I've really noticed the past few years you can see how people are really gravitating back to, um, you know, natural foods that have to, that are, that are, that are local and, and well-grown and, and, you know, they're seeing what's happening, you know, to their own health, to the people around them. So I think the interest is really starting to take hold right now, you know, and um, in kind, there's like just dozens and dozens and dozens of new people 
um, making tallow based skincare products these days. I think that it's really amazing. You know, um, 10 years ago, I couldn't get anyone to pay attention to, uh, to this type of product, except for in certain circles. And, and now everyone's like, oh my God, yeah, shea butter is not all, everything. It's, it, you know, I'm, nothing against shea butter. I use shea butter too, but, um, but just now people are realizing, oh, it doesn't have to be vegan or botanical. It can be, it doesn't have to be plant-based. In fact, animal-based is really much more and more nour nourishing for my skin and for my body. And so um, the way I see it is if, you know, it's going for new nutrient density. And so a meat-based diet is the most nutrient dense diet you can eat, right? I mean, it really is. I mean, you don't need anything else. You know, the rest of it's just, you know, you know, for your mind, <laughs> like I was saying before, just our emotional kinds of eating things. But, um, but if you're just, if you have, if you view it that way, that you're eating for the most nutrient dense food, that's so satisfying and makes you feel really good then your skincare should also be that too. But when you have a really good, healthy diet, you're not going to need a whole lot of skincare anyway, because, you know, it, it, it starts from the inside first, right? It completely does start from, from what, we're, what we're feeding ourselves to begin with. And, um, and, then, and then the rest is just really just bonus. And so, you know, if you're going to apply something to your skin, why not apply something that your body, first of all, can actually absorb? And second, well, there's a lot of things that you can absorb that you shouldn't put on your skin, but, um, but I, what I mean by that is something that your body can, that's, that's, that's biocompatible to your skin as far as how it absorbs, but also um, that is very nutrient dense. So you're, you're feeding yourself topical vitamins when you are applying an animal-based product to your skin. I saw something really interesting in your blog that I was I, I love the articles on your website. Um, they're very informative and very well written. But um, it mentioned kind of the difference between um, just regular tallow and and water buffalo tallow, and how it's so much more nutrient dense. Can you explain that? Yes. So um, water buffalo. Um, okay, there was a health there was a health site out um, about five or six years ago. I don't know what happened to them. I think that they, uh, a friend of mine who found the site and told us about it, um, he's an IT person and he thinks that um, their site, you know, um, got some kind of virus on it and it just, it was, it went away, but they, they did this, um, they collected data from all over the world, universities and test stations from all over the world and gathered um, of, of all the things in the world that people eat, of all the meats that people eat, including small animals and I mean, everything that people eat around the world, which is a lot of stuff. And water buffalo ranked nutritionally as one of the most nutrient dense meats that we could possibly eat. I wish I had printed off all the stuff that they had had on this website before it got closed down. And I don't, I hope that it comes back, but um, I wish I had had collected that data. And we actually went to our local land grant college to um, gather, you know, to get the data about water buffalo meat, because it's not really just on the internet that easy to find, um, because really the only place you can find nutritional data about water buffalo, because they're not that common in the U.S. right now, um, is like from Italy. And so, and they don't even, you know, farm the way we do, you know, most of their animals are, you know, in a dairy environment where they're, you know, um, where they're just, you know, basically in dry lots, you know, so they're just fed fodder and, you know, forages and grain and that kind of thing um, in dairy, in a dairy scenario. But, um, so even when we went there to ask them for whatever nutritional data they could find on water buffalo, um, they didn't want to give it to us because they wanted us to pay for a grad student to do some kind of work for us. And then they would give us this data. And I'm like, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> Things have really changed since I went to college here. But mm -hmm. um, anyway, so we couldn't really get it from them. And so we, we had been looking, you know, otherwise. Well, um, recently, I actually sent in some samples of our tallow um, to have it tested in a lab to see what the nutritional content was. And, you know, I'm like, yes, it, it is really, really nutritious, you know, so I'm going to post that on my website at some time, at some point soon, I was going to have someone, um, someone who's, uh, you know, a science, science and in this community, um, 
person to actually kind of like geek out on it and kind of explain, you know, what this fat is and what it does and what, because there's, it's a list of all kinds of different fatty acids and, and different vitamins and things like that, that I think it would be really fun to have a scientist an actual nutritional scientist break it all down. So I was thinking maybe Dr. Sarah Ballantyne or somebody like that, who loves to nerd out on that kind of stuff might be a good person to do it. But, um, but I would like to post, I'm going to post that on my website pretty soon, but I, I would like to have someone actually analyze it and say, this is what these fats are and what they do and that kind of thing. So, but mm -hmm. um, anyway, so water buffalo, they've not been tampered with like cattle have as far as like genetics go. So, um, you know, it's just kind of the nature of man. We mess with everything, right? You know, and my husband has a way of saying, you know, we um, pasteurize, bastardize everything in our, 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 in our food system, basically. We homogenize, pasteurize, and bastardize everything in our food system is what my husband says. And so we've done that with a lot of genetics. And, and I think that beef cattle have been so manipulated genetically to the point that a lot of people are even allergic to beef um, and there's and you know and bison have been tampered with um, all kinds of species of livestock have been tampered with but because buffalo aren't really that well known here um, that no one's really messed with them so they have really ancient genetics um, in fact they were probably one of the first species of livestock that were um, that were um, you know um, domesticated by man and that was back in ancient Samaria, which is now modern day Iraq, 6,000 years ago. So these animals were living in the marshes. And so they spent their life in mud and water. And so they've been through the whole thing with, you know, with, um, you know, with, with parasites and all kinds of genetic issues and diseases and everything. And now they're this extremely hardy, you know, animal. Um, and they're a cousin of the African Cape Buffalo. That's how they, you know, began to domesticate them a long time ago. Um, and so their genetics are very strong and very pure. And so what they've, what researchers have found is that water buffalo um, will um, digest their food much better than cattle because they have really a slow rumen. So when they're eating their food, they're very, very heavy salivators, which really breaks down the nutrients in their food. Um, and their grasses and forages because it's all rough stuff that you know it takes a lot to get the nutrition out of it right that's why it's not really that good a food for us <laughs> so um anyway so um but they um are very slow um digesters you know their the rumen moves very very slowly so it has a chance to really pull out the nutrients additionally um water buffalo um will eat things that cows won't eat so they have a broad palate they like all kinds of things that cows won't eat and so if you if they have access to it it doesn't mean if you've got your buffalo sitting there in a dairy environment you're just bringing them hay and feed you know they're not going to have access to the wild plants that they would normally want to eat so if they've got ponds and they've got woods and they've got all kinds of browse out there um like vines and 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 all kinds of interesting plants they will experiment and find the things that they like and it's usually a lot of things that have deep roots and so those so the so the deep roots of a lot of these plants draw out minerals from deep in in the earth and they eat those minerals and then that's transferred into the meat um, when you when you eat the meat and so um and so their broad palate is one thing that contributes to a broad range of nutrients um, as well as their digestive system and so with their slow rumen that's a very efficient digestive system um they'll break down um all of the beta carotenes that they consume. So if that converts into retinol. So when you um, have their, their fat, it's never yellow because there's no beta, beta carotene in it. It's been already converted into retinol. So retinol is our most bioavailable form of, bio, of vitamin A. So in its natural form like that, you can, you can just put it right on your skin. You've got your retinol right there. So um, that's, that's one of the amazing. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you hear that retinol is bad it's toxic well yeah i mean if you're using these concentrations of lab made retinol yes it is but if you're getting something that's in a natural bioavailable form like that it's a really really beneficial beneficial um, vitamin to put on your skin or to eat yeah right does your skin and your body recognize it right it, does. it, it knows what to do with all of that with all of the yes. nutrients that are in it and it just thrives Yes, so absolutely. That, yeah, and, and I all found of out that that goes into the meat then translates to your skincare products. Absolutely, as well, because whatever you're putting in your body, you're also putting on your body. That's right. That's right. 
And I think there again, I think it really matters first what you put in your body, you know, because mm -hmm. and that's you're nourishing yourself from the inside out and you can do it from the outside in a little bit too, you know, so and we, we, I mean, I think, you know, people say, oh, well, you don't really need skincare, especially if you're eating a meat based diet. I'm like, well, that's true. But I think skincare there again is like a want. And I think it's okay to want that, you know, it's, it's a way of pampering and nourishing ourselves, you know, when we talk about self care, it's that that thing that ritual that routine every day. That makes us feel good you know it's something that we're doing nice for ourselves and so you know because maybe something smells good or maybe it feels good or just our skin feels really good when we've used this and i don't think there's anything wrong with that at all you know so, <laughs> so. and to replace the products that we get from the grocery store too mm -hmm. um so it's kind of like in some ways it's sort of a luxury and not necessary, but then if you're going to use those kind of products anyway, then mm -hmm. how much better yes. is it to because use something, something like on your, yeah. Putting something on your skin that's actually a vitamin, that's nutrition, it's actually something that will go into your bloodstream that it's beneficial rather than something that your body has to fight with and detox from, you know, later. So, you know, right. so I think, you know, it's, it's just, I think people are finally really starting to wake up to that and realizing, oh yeah, yeah, this is so vital, you know, really, really important. And especially as a lot of people start out on a meat-based diet um, and, you know, whether they're going carnivore, ketovore, even just keto, um, paleo, any of these healthier ways of eating, you know, you're, your body is probably going to go through a healing process. And, you know, and I find that if you're doing pure, you know, just straight carnivore, the healing process happens kind of fast. And for some people, it's just a little too fast, you know, but your body has to go through a whole realignment and a readjustment. And so sometimes that external skincare and support is really helpful. You know, if some people go through breakouts, they lose their hair, you know, there's all kinds of things that happen as their body has to just say, wait, we're going to clean this slate and start over here. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a really, really good thing. It's a really, really good process. And then some people go through it nice and slowly and smoothly, you know, but I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with supporting yourself on the outside too. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, especially as someone who forgets to drink water a lot of the time. <laughs> My skin still gets very dry, especially like this time of year in the winter. Um, and again, I, I go through it again, like at the beginning of fall, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. end of summer. So to have something like your products that I absolutely love, um, <laughs> And they last such a long time, yeah. maybe because I don't need as much, but yes. these products have lasted me months. I'm about due to replenish again. Yeah, and that's um, a good sign when you, don't, in order. when you don't need that much. That's a really good sign. It really is, you know, and yeah. so, I mean, that's, that's the goal, right? <laughs> it's yeah. to get to the place where, you know, your, your, your body is kind of like also in its state of being regenerative, right? It's like sustaining itself, your, you know, your, your, um, your interior microbiome, your, your um, ecosystem on the inside is really coming into balance and it's regenerating, your cells are regenerating and replenishing. So we become a microcosm of regenerative agriculture is, is a way of looking at that, you know, so we can be regenerative too, you know, as an individual unit, <laughs> as a, as a human being that's, you know, as a biological mass, we could also be a regenerative unit that doesn't need a lot of inputs from the outside because we're sustaining ourselves so well, you know. I love that. <laughs> I do too. What a cool way to look at all of this, really. I mean, it's so, I, I just think it's so exciting. Um, I wondered if you'd tell us maybe um, about some of the products that you have available and maybe what your favorites are and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I kind of, you know, like, like a lot of times people, you know, I kind of broke some a lot of the rules for starting a business like this, because, you know, usually you want to kind of get your formulations down, and you keep them that way. And you just you can't make everyone happy, right? You, you're going to have people that can't use them or have a reaction or don't like the smell. There's always you can't make everyone happy. But you know, creating formulations and then just sticking with those is a really good business model. A lot of people have done that and, and have had a lot of success, but I just kind of decided to be fluid and just kind of roll with things a little bit because 
you know, do I keep getting like a feedback in a certain place that needs to change, you know, that kind of thing. So like always that goal of getting things more and more, you know, healthier and better performing all the time. So I have always kind of rolled with changes that I felt like I needed to make with my, with my business and my formulations. And I love formulating. That's probably my favorite part of my business. Um, so like, for example, my tallow face balm for dry and maturing skin, um, that's been probably my longest standing product that's probably gone through like quite a few changes. Um, but it's, it's, it's really just, it's our water buffalo tallow. And I found some really nice shea butter because I never really used shea butter before because that was the thing. So I'm like, let's do something different. <laughs> but now um, I've, I've found a place for shea butter and it works really, really well with this balm. And it has some squalane oil in it. And it has um, some crushed pearl or pearl powder um, that gives you a lot of magnesium. So it's a, it's a really nice calming, but very satiating balm that's not too heavy. Um, so you can put it on and it does kind of like you feel like I'm protected, you know, I'm protected from the wind. I'm protected from the weather. Um, and so it kind of gives your skin just this feeling of being really protected with long lasting moisture. And you can put it on under makeup and that kind of thing, but it is one of my long standing products that um, has kind of stood the test of time. Um, also my tallow and emu balm is one of um, probably my very best seller. And it has been since way a long time ago when we first started making it. And, um, and so it's now everyone makes a tallow and emu balm I've noticed, but, um, so it's a really, really good combination. Um, and emu oil is, um, it happened when I, when I first got started, um, someone says, can you make something that's just really plain, that's maybe for babies, that doesn't have any essential oils, that's just really plain and basic, you know, because I'm trying to heal this issue with autoimmune disease or something else, you know, and so um, I was trying to come up with an idea uh, for something that would be really simple that they could use because pure tallow is hard and waxy. It's not soft and creamy. Um, so if something, if there is a tallow that's soft and creamy, it's really been a mixture of something else. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe some other subcutaneous fats, but really tallow, um, pure tallow is very hard and waxy. So it does need something that's soft to go with it to be spreadable. So I was, um, you know, trying to come up with an idea there. And then someone said, hey, how about lanolin? And that way it would be animal based. And I was like, that's a really great idea, except for that I know that lanolin is very allergenic for a lot of people. And I know that from um, being in the alpaca industry and having alpacas and, um, and you know, shearing and being, you know, having all the fiber and all the things we do with that, um, that a lot of people go to alpaca because they can't handle the lanolin in sheep's wool. So so um, I was, but then I was remembering um, back in the days when I worked in the um, whole, you know, and when I worked in the um, natural foods industry, um, there was a, a fellow rep who sold emu oil. And I knew about it because I had a friend that used to raise emus um, way back 30 years ago and went bust because it was like this huge thing that came to America and then didn't do so well for a long time um, because people didn't really understand the benefits of using emu oil at all. It was, it was way ahead of its time. Um, and this rep really loved this one kind of emu oil that she sold and um, had given me some samples of it. And I really did love it. But when you use pure emu oil, it's, um, you know, most people think, oh, it's this moisturizer. Well, it's really not at all. It, it absorbs so fast that it's not moisturizing. It'll leave your skin feeling really dry. That's why they like to use it on, um, on dermaceutical patches and, and um, pharmaceutical patches and that kind of thing, because it absorbs so fast, but it provides a tremendous amount of vitamins and people experience an analgesic effect. Um, so it, it relieves pain. It does all kinds of amazing, miraculous things. And so I thought, why not use some emu oil with my tallow? And um, at one of my online um, farmer's markets, a fellow vendor um, had their, you know, it was, a, it was a, a re almost, it was a retired military couple. They had a, their own emu farm and they, that's what they did for their living was sold their emu products. And so I made a relationship with them and I was buying just, you know, straight emu oil and emu cream from them. Um, they have since recently retired. So I've had to find other sources for emu oil, but I'm telling you, this stuff is really magical, you know, when you combine it with tallow, especially, um, but it did leave kind of a drying effect. So it was good for my customers that had you know, very oily skin or acneic skin or eczema um, and babies. It was really great for baby rashes and so forth. So mm -hmm. those are probably two really notable products. Um, I, um, when I started making my own soap or, or before I started making my own soap, um, a soap maker friend of ours 
um, approached me about making tallow soap for my website. And so I, I, at the time I was just working out of a really small space and I didn't have room to make soap. So she made my soaps for me for a while. And then once we moved into a, a much bigger space, um, I started making soaps too, but people kept requesting shampoo bars and um, the ones that she was making um, were very popular. People loved them, but I really didn't get a whole lot of feedback about how they interacted with people's hair. Did it leave your hair, you know, feeling dry and tangly or was it really soft and smooth? You know, I didn't really get a lot of feedback, but they sold like crazy. And so um, when I started kind of delving into making my own shampoo bars, um, that was another whole animal when you open up hair care. Um, because even though hair care seems to be very similar to, sh to skin care, in some ways it is, it's a completely different ball game and how, you know, our hair interacts with different products. And so um, to make a long story short, I make two types of shampoo. I make a, a tallow-based shampoo bar that is really technically soap. Um, and you need to use a vinegar rinse with it to lower the pH after you've opened up those um, those hair cuticles. Um, and and I and I make a, um, a conditioner to go with it as well. Um, but for the people that that doesn't quite work well for, I've created an, another shampoo um, base that um, that's made with some gentle surfactants and. I use MSM and um, magnesium ascorbyl phosphate with it um, because it's kind of like a hair growth tonic and um, it's been scientifically proven. So I put those proportions in to this formulation so that people that are, you know, kind of like struggling with their hair and there are a lot of people right now are like having hair issues, like scalp issues. This is a formula that really, really works well for that. And you don't need a, um, a, an ACV rinse to go with it. You don't need any vinegar to go with it. It just goes well by itself or you can use a conditioner with it. So those are some of, um, some of my really popular products right now. Um, there's more, but, um, but those are some of my, my very popular products. And my soaps, of course, um, do really, really well too too for us so I even have a carnivore soap <laughs> so um so I um my the original soap recipe that my friend came up with um we were going to do a pure tallow soap but my tallow tends to have so much omega-3 in it that it turns pink which is a sign of rancidity which doesn't really hurt the soap at all or anything like that but we were just trying to come up with something a little bit different and her favorite recipe that she came up with had um, organic olive oil and some castor oil in it and it just performed really, really beautifully. It was a, it was just a formulation that really stuck with my customers. And so we have that. We do some other things too, but we do have one soap that is um, made with um, tallow and lard and ghee and emu oil, and it's very popular. People go crazy for it. So I'm really glad because it's, uh, it, it is, it's like a, it, it does have a moisturizing effect because I think because of the um, all of the ingredients combined together um, and. I do what I call a super fat in my formulation, which is a percentage of oils that I leave behind to leave on your skin. So it has a lot of glycerin in it. So it feels really moisturizing when you use this soap. So that's just a, a few things. <laughs> awesome. I wanted to hear you describe a couple because when I got on the website and looked at everything, I thought your descriptions of everything were so beautifully written. Well, thank you. Thank and you. that anybody could go on there and just so easily pick something that would work well for them. So I just wanted to kind of hear it in your own words because Thank I knew you. people would be like, oh, this sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think I've, I've tried most of those and love all of them, but also the cleansing balm for your mm -hmm. face with the, the instructions to put it on and then lay a warm cloth over your face and just relax. <laughs> it's in the instructions. I need to right. sit here for minutes and not be disturbed. Yes, yes. And I, one of the things I really love about that product too, because like when oil cleansing, the oil cleansing method was just kind of this huge thing, you know, the, the oils that they were recommending that people use were like sunflower oil and castor oil. And um, I can't remember what the other oil was, but those are, you know, kind of more, um, especially like the sunflower oil is more going more into the seed oils there. And, and a lot of people are really learning to perhaps avoid those types of oils. If you're not going to eat those and don't put them on your skin too. And I agree with that. And so I was kind of thinking at that time, you know, what kind of oils could I use if I were going to offer a cleansing oil? And I'm like, it's not really in my repertoire because I'm a tallow based skincare line. So I want to do everything I can with tallow. And, um, and so I thought, why not a cleansing balm with tallow, you know, something that was easy to spread on your face, 
but would come off easily, um, removing that makeup and that kind of thing. And so I played around with it for a while before I finally came up with a formulation. So I infuse um, some different flowers into the tallow, um, like calendula, and there's lemon peel, um, roses, and uh, lavender. And so those flowers are just really calming and gentle to skin. And um, of course the lemon, the lemon pill is kind of cleansing. So um, I thought those, that would be a nice blend, you know, for your face. And, um, and I found that you don't even have to repeat when you go to, you know, when you go to rinse, um, I've added the hydrogenated um, castor oil, just a small amount. And what that does is it kind of acts like a solubizer. So it allows you to wash that off cleanly and get the dirt out of there too, a little more cleanly. Um, but when you're finished, because tallow wants to absorb into your skin, it's not really just going to sit there on the surface. Um, you want it, you want to cleanse away whatever dirt and impurities you can find. And I'm always surprised when I see how much dirt really does come off my face. But when you're finished, um, you don't really need to do a moisturizer afterwards. You don't need a toner. You don't need a serum. You don't need a mask. You don't need to put on any other moisturizer. You just leave your skin alone and it will just, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes I think we do way too much to our skin. Um, we just need to be a little more simple, a little more, you know, just, uh, you know, a little more natural. And so I think that um, having tallow in that oil cleansing um, process just leaves your skin just kind of feeling refreshed and moisturized without you don't need anything else and so that was kind of the idea behind that because a lot of people you like at night especially it's like you don't really want to be you know doing a million things you know you want to just kind of you know hurry up and get to bed or to watch your show or whatever so you know so not having a, a routine that's overly complicated I think um, means a lot to a lot of people mm -hmm. yeah it's very luxurious feeling and and clean feeling once you rinse mm -hmm. it off Yes, thank you. <laughs> That's the intention. So, <laughs> yeah. Amy, do we have anything else? Uh, I think, I think that's it. Do you, now this doesn't have to go in like, well, I'll stop before that and take this part out, obviously, but there's like a, a big, Amy, you mentioned this earlier about, um, like we keep seeing these carnivores who are buying this big can of tallow on Amazon. <laughs> Do you, I didn't see anything like that on your website. No, like to sell to other people, like a can of tallow to sell to other people to make their own. Yeah, like they're, they're just like whipping it and eating it. Oh, yeah. Like, so they're probably buying it from one of the, um, there's, you know, a few different companies out there that render tallow um, and um, they do mix in sub subcutaneous fats. <laughs> so that's how you can get something that's soft and creamy like that. Um, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It won't hurt you. Um, it's just not the purest form. Like if you're using really pure, um, really pure tallow comes only from suet. Okay, and so the suet is a slab of fat that surround the kidney area um, in, a, in a ruminant animal. So, um, and so in that, in that slab of fat, when you, um, it's going to be very hard and waxy. And then when you render it, the tallow, the fat that's rendered when it, when it um, comes to room temperature and hardens should also be hard and waxy. Um, but a lot of these companies do mix in some other kinds of fats. And that's how you get that really soft you know, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's just not going to be the purest form or the highest quality form for skincare. Um, so the, the, the most nutrients and vitamins and, and everything that you really kind of want to use in your skincare is going to be concentrated into this, into the suet. And so mm -hmm. when you have a well-finished animal, they will have a nice, you know, um, most, most cattle buffalo will have like five or 10 pounds of suet per carcass, you know, per thousand pound animal. Um, it's not like this huge amount of stuff that's being thrown away when they do throw it away. But I always tell people, if you have an opportunity to get suet, whether someone's going to give it to you or sell it to you, get it, you know, make stuff with it. It doesn't matter how the cow was raised. You know, if it's something that's going to be thrown away, don't let that happen, you know, take it and, you know, render it and, you know, cook with it, you know, fry your French fries in it, or, you know, make candles, make soap, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can do. Um, even if we live in an apartment and in, um, in a city to be sort of like little mini homesteaders, there's things that we can do that contribute toward, you know, regenerative agriculture. But I think when we're really, you know, focusing on, um, you know, being puritanical about it, 
I kind of want to go for the best nutrition. So I'm really, a, you know, a big fan and a fanatic about 100% grass fed and, um, and using the pure suet, you know, uh, using the, the pure suet for the pure tallow. Um, but you can use the other kinds of fats too. And so just, just to mention that, but um, another thing that people I see out there on the internet, um, I see all kinds of things and I'm like, some days I'm like, please don't look <laughs> right. right. Because I can't, you know, I can't believe some of the things people put out there. Some people with huge followings put out really awful information sometimes. But um, so if um, if it comes from a pig, it is not tallow. There's no such thing as pig tallow. It's um, it would be called lard. And so that's the corresponding the corresponding um, fat would be the leaf fat that surrounds the kidneys in a pig. But they're a monogastric. Um, they're not a ruminant, and so that would be lard. So anything that comes from a pig would be either rendered pork fat or it would be lard that comes from the leaf fat. But if it's from a ruminant animal, um, that would be, you know, cattle and buffalo, and bison, antelope, you know, giraffes, <laughs> um, um, elephants, deer, you know, there's sheep, um, all kinds of animals that are ruminants. But a ruminant animal has the, has the suet that surrounds their kidney area, and then that's rendered into tallow. Um, for an emu, um, emus are a ratite, um, so they're a, a flightless land bird. Um, they're full of car they're full of cartilage and feathers. They're they don't have like big um, you know thighs and breasts like chickens do. They're they're mostly just a bunch of feathers and cartilage. What little bit of meat you can find on them is not desirable. Um, so I mean, it's, you know, people do eat it, but it's not the most favorite thing, but the oil is in the cavity of that. Um, it's, it's a, um, it's a drum inside of the, inside of the cavity of the, of the bird that is, you know, rendered into emu oil, just to kind of let people know where that comes from. And, um, you know, so that's, that's where emu oil comes from. Um, I'm trying to think, so, you know, and then if there's lanolin, a lot of people like to use lanolin. Those who aren't allergic to it, um, it comes from the actual sheep's hair. So when sheep are shorn, when wool sheep are shorn, um, there's a process that removes the sebum. It's basically basically the sebum um, from the from the sheep's wool that is is um, basically collected into you know into enough of a, um, a product to be called. Um, you know, lanolin. So there's some other things out there too that people use that are interesting um, animal products too, but we don't have to get into that, to that today, but those are kind of the main ones that I think people have access to and can appreciate and, and utilize. Just amazing. Like I'm learning so much. This <laughs> <Me too>. great. <laughs> we need to take a field trip to the farm and check all this out, Shelly. I agree. Where are you guys located? Pennsylvania. Okay, you will come on down. <laughs> we have extra rooms in the in the house, and and yeah, you would probably enjoy coming down for a visit. I would, we would love to have you anytime. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> that would be fantastic. We may never leave though. That would... Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay too. We'll just put you to work. <laughs> Perfect. That's right up my alley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And for me, you know, being a farmer, um, you know, it's kind of like um. I do, I'm a full-time farmer and I do Buffalo Gal full-time too. So basically it's two part-time things that become two full-time things. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but I, you know, some people say, well, you know, like even to my husband, like, you know, why don't we hire some help, you know, to help you on the farm so that Shelly can focus more over here on Buffalo Gal, because I've really grown this company very, very slowly, you know, just in according, accordance to our supply of tallow. It was meant to be really a value added company, right? Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's growing and growing and growing. And, um, but, you know, but the thing is, is that like part of me being connected to my products is being connected to my farm too so you might see me out there you will see me out there you know moving the electric nets for the sheep and you know and um, helping my husband move things around and catch livestock and do all the work out there too so I'm, I'm a farmhand just as much as I am anything else so um, and that's really I think a good thing you know it's exercise it's sunshine it's my connection to the land and to the animals that you know the that my products come from so I kind of I like that. I think I'm proud of that. You know, <laughs> I, I think that's so important to have that understanding of all aspects and really be in there, literally getting your hands dirty. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and then producing yeah. a high quality product, both in the meat 
part and, and in the skincare part. So thank you. Thank you. It's a labor of love. And, um, you know, and I would say that, you know, over the years, it's just really been amazing to me um, how, you know, um, how, how much I've, I'm really, this is kind of like the time I've been waiting for, waiting for people to really start catching on and really starting to get it. And they do now, you know, it's really, really cool. So I think it's really amazing to see this type of thing really explode and take hold, um, you know, because I think that we're facing, you know, some big challenges, you know, from those in the world who would rather beat this kind of thing down, you know, and so like even at our local land grant college, um, where I graduated, you know, in agriculture, um, nowadays, it's all about, you know, it's, it's only about big ag and the big commodities and, you know, the, um, the, the you know, the, the, the plots of, um, you know, monocropped agriculture, and the way that they teach those students, because these students have told me <laughs> that they're taught that regenerative agriculture were the enemy now, you know, because they see us as the enemy because the land that we're using for regenerative agriculture could be put back into wildlife. And I'm like, okay, so our hundred acres, you know, family, family, or our 200 family acres right here in the middle of a, you know, uh, place that's becoming quite urban, um, you know, if it were not a, a regenerative farm, it would be a parking lot or another neighborhood right now. That's what it would be. It's not going to turn back into, you know, wolves and coyotes. And I mean, we do have coyotes, but we, it was, it's not going to be lions, tigers, and bears, you know, and, and elk and reindeer. It's going to be, um, you know, it's, it would be a parking lot or a shopping center or another subdivision. It would not be, you know, what you, what you're being told that it would be. And so there's that mindset that now that regenerative agriculture is kind of seen as the enemy. I'm, I'm starting to see that really kind of happening. And then, you know, you hear these voices out there, but I think that with more and more people really coming back to themselves and realizing their health is really important and, you know, and what they're doing is not working. Pharmaceutical drugs is not going to work, not going to help them. You know, they're starting to take back their um, sovereignty. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally, <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, and I encourage people to, you know, go volunteer for a farm, you know, and a lot of times you just want to make sure you don't get the way, but sometimes it's harder for them, for someone to stop and show you what to do than it is to just finish what they're doing. But I think, you know, offering to volunteer, you know, sometimes some, I, we have guys that, you know, they're really into working out and they're like, you know, let us know when you've got a lot of hay to move or something or <laughs> you know, something like that, you know, so they can come and get a workout and be connected to that food. And then of course they want us to make some burgers for them later, you know, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I, you know, one of the things I've noticed um, just as a little side note, um, when families do come to visit our farm when we have um, uh, open house days where families come from all over, especially Atlanta, to bring their kids out to the farm. Um, you know, we have all these neat things for them to see. You know, you know, there's baby animals over here. There's baby lambs. There's, you know, baby alpacas. There's our camel. You know, um, there's all these neat things to see. And the kids always go to these things and say, okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. But what, the only thing that they really wanted to do was go down into our driveway and just dig their hands in the sand, you know, because we have a lot of sand in our driveway and they just will sit there for hours and just play in that dirt and that sand, you know, they just ground themselves and they, you know, they just go into another world, you know, you see them completely unwind from modern life and just relax right into the earth right in front of you. That's just really what they wanted to do was just get their hands in that soil. <laughs> that sounds amazing. I would like to yeah. do that as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We forget to do those things. So. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you again, Shally. We really You're appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. Like I said, I, I've learned so much. Oh, good, it, good. <laughs> me too. I've been sitting here just listening so intently. <laughs> just like, oh, I didn't know that. It, it's so interesting. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing all of that knowledge and your experience with us. Um, we'll, of course, have both websites, but they're, they're connected, but I'll list both links um, in the description of the video okay. and, and share it with everybody. And awesome. Yeah. Any other. And, and if sometime, if you ever want to talk to my husband, um, like he's much more eloquent and well-spoken than I am. Um, and he is a, a trip. He's really a funny guy. He's um, very Southern and, you know, but he's, 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 he's really a great person to interview sometime. If you want to just say, Hey, let's talk to a real regenerative farmer right here. Yes. And let's get his, you know, let's grill him and ask his question. He has great stories that you 
will blow your mind actually and are really kind of entertaining and funny so if you ever want to interview him sometime um that would be amazing <laughs> yeah, his name, he's really a character everyone loves him so you will you would enjoy him a lot too right He's much less of an introvert than me. He's he's quite a character. <laughs> <laughs> that that would be absolutely wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he would, I'm sure he would be happy to do it. No, it's great. Thank you thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was so nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you, Sally. Tell the yes. husband we said hi. Yes, okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.